Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but also we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. All right. Good morning, church. How are we? <clears throat> hey, if you were here last week, I have one question for you. How nervous are you right now? <laughs> hey, everything's fine. I got cleared to preach. We're all good. I actually wanted to clear it. If you weren't here, I'm just going to revel in that. You'd have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, but I actually uh, had somebody on the way in ask me how my back was doing. So I, I, this story has actually grown from last week, but um, everything, everything's great. If, if you also weren't with us last week, uh, we started a brand new series on the letter of Romans. <clears throat> and we've been talking about Paul for the weeks before that and how Paul wrote 13 of the letters in the New Testament. And, and this one letter, Romans, is, is actually considered his, his magnum opus. It, it is his most influential letter <clears throat> that he wrote. It's been read through the ages and influenced so many pastors and theologians and thinkers. You can look at the story of Augustine and how he read Romans. You can read about that and it changed his life. The same is true for, for Martin Luther, uh, who started the Reformation movement. I mean, he, when he read Romans, it changed the trajectory of his life. And I say all that to tell you, please be reading through this book on your own, completely and thoroughly. Grab some commentaries, learn more about it. Church, do not just come here on Sundays trying to learn about the letter of Romans. There's not enough time to do that adequately. So we wanna encourage you to do that. Now, last week, if you missed, we, we walked through chapters one through three, and we kind of summarized each chapter and then walked through them. Today, I just want to recap those summaries. And so we said chapter one was, was here's a summary for chapter one. All, it was all about humanity is trapped in sin and needs to be rescued, that all of humanity is, is trapped in this sin, that we have a tendency throughout time to, to turn away from God and, and to trust in our own thinking and our own reasoning. And we read in Romans 1.25 that they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And one of the biggest lies that we chase after in life is that we should have the freedom to live life however we want to live, that there should be no guardrails on our lives from God or Christianity, that we should be able to do what we want, when we want, however we want to do it. So we're trapped. So chapter two was categorized like this or summarized as the law and the Torah is not enough to rescue you. And, and if you remember, this letter is written to a church in Rome that is made up of Gentiles and Jews. And so this part, chapter two, was really geared toward the Jewish people who had a tendency to rely on their own good deeds and their law and their behavior to be right with God. But Paul is essentially saying that is not enough to save you. You are no better than anybody else. You're in the same boat as they are. And, and he said this in chapter two, verse one, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. In chapter three, we summarize like this, that it is God's righteousness that has rescued us through Jesus. And we look through chapter three and how Paul diligently explains that none of our goodness is good enough 
to actually save us. And it's, it's in faith alone, through Christ alone, that we have this relationship with God, not anything else. And he says in Romans 3, 23 to 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And so basically chapters one through three, Paul is making it very clear. We all need the gospel, every single one of us, that it is not based on what we have done, but the gospel is based on what God has done for us. And then he starts to dive deeper into chapters four and five. And that's what we're going to cover today. Chapter four, Paul just, he, he really dives into the story of Abraham in the Old Testament to help nail this point home from chapters one through three. And we'll, we'll do that. We'll jump back to Genesis here in a minute to look at that. And then chapter five, Paul starts to explain if this is all true. And if you've put your faith in Christ, it should change your life forever and for the better. Well, let's jump into chapter four. Chapter four, verse one says this, Abraham was humanly speaking, the founder of the Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Now, real quick, these first three verses, I'm actually gonna read from the NLT, the New Living Translation. I found NIV to be a little wordy. And, and we've said this before, and I had a conversation with a few people after the first service. And when, when you have a, a translation of the Bible that you enjoy reading, that is a, that's great. Every now and then, if you run into something that's just, you're just having a hard time understanding it, we recommend grabbing a few other translations of scripture to help you kind of get it. And I found the NLT to be helpful for verses one through three. Now, what Paul is doing here is actually really amazing because he knows he's talking to these, these Jewish people that are following Jesus in the church in Rome. And he knows that they've had you know, a long tendency to make their relationship with God based on their following the rules or the law or their good behavior. And he knows that they revered the law. They also loved the man who brought the law. And that was Moses. All throughout the gospels, you see Moses' name mentioned. They highly revered Moses. Another person in their history is that, that they highly revered was Abraham. And, and Abraham was the one who started the nation of Israel. And we'll get into that in a minute. Maybe you grew up in a church and you remember the song, Father Abraham, who had many sons, right? God goes to him in Genesis 12 and he says, I'm, I'm gonna make a nation from you. So what Paul is doing here and he's saying, hey folks, you know Abraham, you love Abraham, you revere Abraham. And then he asks this question, what is he learning? What is he discovering about being made? right with God. Paul goes on in a few more verses. He says, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about, but that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now that if that he starts with there is a really big if, right? If if it was his good deeds that made him righteous, he'd be able to brag about it. Look what I have done. Essentially, Paul is saying that if Abraham's good deeds had made him right with God, he would be able to say, God, you owe me because I've done X, Y, and Z. How, re how ridiculous is it to think that we could look to the creator of the universe and say, I think you owe me one. And so Paul clearly states that is not the ways of God. That's not how it worked. You all know this, you, folks in this church in Rome, you know that it was credit to him as righteous because of his faith in what God had told him. Paul goes on to give a few more, two more examples in the next few verses. The first one is about working and earning money. He says in verses four through five, now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Now, if you work for somebody, you know this to be true. If you work all week long and they come to you and say, hey, thanks for, thanks for what you did. I, I wanna give you a gift for that. <laughs> you would laugh You're like, no, I deserve that money. You owe that to me. And he's essentially saying that we can't do this with God and say, God, you owe me because I've worked you know, X amount or done so much. It is through his grace that we have this relationship. He goes on to give one more example that the Jewish people would have quickly recognized. He says in verses nine through 10, we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances, this is a rhetorical question actually, under what circumstances was it that it was credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. Now, 
And one of the major rules for the Jewish nation was that all men had to be circumcised. Now, the the why and what behind that, we'll do that another time, but it's really important to know that circumcision was a really big deal to the Jewish people. And it was a works-oriented way for them to make sure they were right with God. And they believed if you were not circumcised, you were not a part of the people of God. And so Abraham, Abraham, I'm sorry, Paul is making it clear to them. He goes, hey, Abraham, he was right with God. Now, was that before or after he was circumcised? And they knew the answer. It was long before. Circumcision hadn't even become a thing yet in the Old Testament. Now, up to this point, Paul is just doing a tremendous amount of work to make it very clear that we all need the gospel and that it has nothing to do with what we have done throughout our lives, but it's all based on what God has done for us. What God has done for us through Christ and the work on the cross. Now, the really smart Jews in this room, in this church in Rome, as they're hearing this letter read aloud to them, they would have started to make uh, some connections. They would have connected these dots to the story of Abraham and, and thinking through what God had done for him and for his people throughout time. And they would have remembered the story in Genesis chapter 15. And I think it's really important for us to dive into that story to fully understand what God has done for Abraham and for us. And so if you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Genesis 15. And and I'm actually going to pull a lot of content from uh, an incredible book. It's called The The Epic of Eden. It's by a lady named Sandra Richter. She was a professor at Asbury for years and then moved on. But this book is actually um, a commentary on the entire Old Testament. But it's a very short and very approachable book. I actually recommend reading this. And I just I'm going to pull some content from uh, her her part on Genesis and, and Abraham. Now, before we get to chapter 15 and and chapter 12 is where God approaches Abraham and and says, Abraham, I want to pull you from here. I'm going to plant you here and make you into a nation. And here's, here's what he says in Genesis 12, one through three, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land. I will show you, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. Now, when God made this promise to Abraham, Abraham had two immediate barriers to becoming a nation. Barrier number one, he had no kids. He was childless. And that's, that's a really big deal. You can't have a nation if you don't have any kids. And barrier number two was that he had no land. God just said, I'm calling you from this land. I'm going to show you a new place, but currently you're landless. And it's really hard to have a nation if you don't have land. But God continues to promise him in the chapters to come, I'm going to do this. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to bless you. And through you, everybody on the planet will be blessed. Well, then we get to chapter 15 and, you know, some time has passed. But ultimately, he is still childless. Abraham still has no land. And God has just made the same promise to him again. And in chapter 15, verses 2 through 6, Abraham says this. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, and this servant in my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can even count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. That's that verse that Paul was talking about in chapter four of Romans. Now, it's really important for us to remember and understand we're trying to figure out this foundational truth in our faith that that it is what God has done for us. It's what God does for Abraham and he's done for his people throughout history. That's what we're focusing on. And that's what we're going to understand through the next 10 verses. So just recap. Abraham is like, God, I have no kids. How am I going to have a nation? God says, count the stars. Abraham believes him. He says, okay, I credit to you as righteousness. And then Abraham asks a very legitimate question. Okay, God, thank you. I believe it. I thank you, but uh, land, I don't have any land. Like, how is that going to work out? And God does something extraordinary here. God makes a covenant with Abraham. Now, a covenant is essentially a promise or an oath between two people or two kingdoms. 
And God makes this covenant with Abraham and to really understand the importance behind this. This is where I'm going to pull some information from that book, The Epic of Eden. We need to understand what covenant making looked like in the time of Abraham in the ancient Near East world. So essentially what would happen during Abraham's time is throughout the land, there were so many petty kings and kingdoms. And oftentimes these kingdoms would come together or these kings and they would make a a, a pact or a covenant or a treaty together. And then they would benefit from each other in this covenant. They would benefit agriculturally. They would benefit militarily. They would benefit monetarily from one another. And so they would make this contract or treaty. Now there's actually two types of treaties that would be made. One is a parity treaty and the other is called the suzerian and vassal treaty. Now let's get the two of these, you know, clarified. A parity treaty was when two kingdoms, very equal size, would come together and say, hey, let's just make a parity treaty and let's, let's benefit from, from one another. But the suzerian and vassal treaty, this was different. This is where a suzerian is a much larger kingdom, a more powerful kingdom, and the vassal would be a smaller kingdom or a smaller nation. And a lot of times, you know, maybe the smaller nations would go to the larger ones and say, we need protection from these other people. So let's make this covenant and, and we'll, we'll benefit from one another. But a lot of times really it was, it was the larger kingdom coming to the vassal or the smaller kingdom and, and essentially forcing them into this kind of covenant. Now, a lot of times they would talk to one another in these covenants and they, they, would, they would say that, you know, the larger kingdom, they would call them father and the smaller kingdom would be called son or they would, they would call them Lord and they would call them servant. And there's actually several biblical examples of these kind of treaties happening throughout the Old Testament. And one of them is in, in the book of Joshua. And in the book of Joshua, he is on a conquest to grab more land for the Israelite people. And this small band of people come to Joshua and the Israelites. And we read this in Joshua chapter nine, verse 11. And our elders, this is from the smaller nation, and all those living in our country said to us, take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. You can hear it. We, we want you be our Lord, we'll be your servants. Make a treaty with us. Sandra Richter goes on to explain this Hebrew word for treaty is actually that you say this right here, cut a barit, which is, means covenant. Will, will you come and cut a covenant with us? And we know this language, right? We say this all the time, you want want to cut a deal? Let's cut a deal. Let's make this deal. But today we sit down together and we fill out the paperwork and we make copies and we each get a piece of that. That is not how covenant making worked in the Old Testament in the time of Abraham. Here's how a Caesarean vassal treaty or covenant was made. They would take animals and they would sacrifice the animals. And then they would cut them in half and lay them apart opposite one another. And the smaller kingdom or king or the vassal would walk between the pieces and recite the covenant aloud. And essentially when doing this, they were saying, if I do not hold up to my end of this deal or this covenant, may what has happened to these animals happen to me. That's a very motivating contract, right? Like that would keep you on track and out of debt, I think. Like that, that's like, okay, yeah, let's, no, I'm kidding. We shouldn't do that. Um, so Abram does this. Right? God says, let's make a covenant. Abram says, I'm childless. And he says, you're going to have to, okay, I trust you, Lord. He says, I have no land. And then God responds like this. Chapter 15, verse 9 through 10. So the Lord said to him, Abraham, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. Can you anticipate what is about to happen here? I mean, you can almost imagine as God has said, let's make this covenant, Abraham is preparing these animals. And, and as Abraham is you know, going through the bloody work and setting them apart from one another, think about what was going through Abraham's mind. The Lord is making a covenant with me. And I'm, I'm about to walk through these animal pieces and I'm gonna recite everything that I have said I will do. And then I wonder if it hits Abraham, wait a minute. I haven't said anything, only God, only the Lord has, he's promised me a child. He's promised me a land. He has promised me a nation. I can almost see Abraham, Matt, how is this gonna work? And the next few verses go on to tell us that as the sun began to set, God puts Abram into a deep 
sleep, very similar to what we read in Genesis with, with, with Adam. And he puts him into a deep sleep and God again recites the promises he has made to Abraham. And in verse 17, we read this. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Sandra Richter goes on to say this in her book. But did you notice who it was that passed between the torn and bloody parts of the sacrificed animals? Who by his actions announced, may what has happened to these animals happen to me if I fail to keep my oath. Not the weaker party, but rather the Lord of the cosmos. This is a story of what God has promised to do for Abraham and the lengths that he would go to do it. And now I, I want to walk us back to, I want to walk us back to the New Testament slowly, right? The, the, the entire Old Testament is essentially God holding on to his promises for his people. Yet the people of Israel, the, the, the Israelites, the people of God continue over and over again to fail God and they get in the way and they break this covenant over and over again. And essentially we get back to the gospels and we notice that this covenant is finally made whole. But whose flesh was torn due to the broken covenant? Jesus of Nazareth on the cross. And so in the story of the gospel, we see what God has not only done for Abraham, but what he has done for us. And essentially chapters one through three of, of Rome, the letter of Romans is telling us none of us are good enough. And, and we continue to fail. We try and try and try, but we're just not good enough to do this. And, and it comes back to this. It's what God has done for us. It is what God has done for us on the cross that gives us new life, that makes us justified, right? That is what he's talking about with, with, with Abraham, that he believed and had faith and God credited him righteousness, which means you were justified. This word justified or justification is used throughout the letter of Romans. And to help us understand that word a little bit better, I want you to look at this real quick. This is how God justified Abraham. He gave him a new status. You know, we didn't read about this, but he goes from Abram and God changes his name to Abraham. He gives him a brand new status. And then he brings him into a new family. He gives him the child and the nation that he promised the people of Israel. And then he gives him a new future and a new purpose in life. And then when we get to the work of the cross, when we have faith in Christ, the same thing happens for us. We have a new status in Christ and we enter into a new family, the family of God. And we have a new future. We have a hope and we have a purpose in life that we did not have before. Paul actually clears all of this up and, and, and zooms in on this idea in Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter five. Here's what he says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. So Paul, again, has worked so hard in chapters one through four to explain that it is all about what God has done for us and that we are justified by our faith in him alone. And then he moves into chapter five and he begins to say, you know, if this is true, it will change your life forever. And he begins to explain how that happens. But first I wanna talk about a little bit of a misconception that I think happens. Unfortunately, maybe some people teach it and maybe some people just latch onto it, but sometimes people will think, you know, okay, when I believe, when I, when I put my faith and I get in that water, then all the bad stuff in my life is just gonna melt away. All my life's been so hard and now everything's just gonna be better. That would be awesome. It's just not true. You know, there's so many believers here who could stand up and say the same. I mean, look at the life of Paul. Paul gave his life to Christ and to God and to planting churches, but his life was still very difficult. Jesus promised in the gospels that our lives in this world will be hard. Paul was put in jail several times and, and history holds that he was eventually beheaded for his faith. And so if that's not the way that life gets better when we are justified by putting our faith in Christ, what is Paul getting at here? Well, let's read chapter five. Verse five or chapter five, verse one, he says this, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access 
by faith into the grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And so he says, because we put our faith in him in this relationship and we are made right, we now have peace with God and we have gained access to him. And we have this confident hope in in the glory that we will share with him one day. And I really wanna focus in on this word right here, this idea of peace that Paul says we gain. We gain peace with God. Now, there's a lot of ways to talk about this word peace in our world. I would imagine a lot of us here today would talk about our lives in a way that like, gosh, it's not that peaceful. I mean, we are running a million miles an hour. We've got kids in school and sports and there's drop off and pick up and we gotta take care of the house and I've got job and I'm traveling and it's just crazy. But that's not the peace Paul's talking about. That stuff is honestly, that's just more our fault. We, we, just, we just book too much, too fast, too quick and too short a time and we need to pull back the reins there. But I'll, I'll, we'll do that soapbox some other time. Another way that our world tends to chase after peace and hope and joy is through our circumstances. Our world tends to think, man, if our circumstances are right, then I'll have peace. So I just can't have anything bad happen. And life has to be, I gotta be having fun and it's gotta go well and nothing can bad happen to me or people around me. And so we seek for peace in our circumstances, which is just, it's foolish. We also seek for peace in the things that we can achieve. We try and you know, get the promotion or get that new job or get, a, get that raise. And if I could just do that, then gosh, we'll have enough, we'll have enough margin in our house then and we'll, we'll, it'll be better and we'll have peace. We also try and purchase it. Right, if we can just get that house with that lot, if we can just get that nicer car, and people chase after the nicest cars thinking that's gonna make their lives better. And, and you all, you've experienced this. I mean, there's people here, I almost guarantee it, who have bought a brand new car and within a week later after I'm driving it off the lot, somebody sideswiped you. And you've experienced it and you know that those things of our world can be taken from us so quickly. And that kind of peace just doesn't last. One of the greatest examples that we chase after peace from our circumstances is actually in the sports world. If there's any sports fans here, you know this to be true. If you have kids, you know this to be true, right? If they lose the game, you don't talk to them for hours. If they win the game, they're the happiest people on the planet. Now, what I love is when in the professional sports world, uh, Christians uh, show up and begin to, to clarify that their peace actually doesn't come from the game and the tournament or the championship but it comes from Jesus. You know, a couple of months ago, I believe it was that the um, softball, NCAA softball world series happened in, in Oklahoma. These girls have won, I think the last couple of years and they do an incredible job in a press conference talking about how their peace and joy in life comes from Christ and not from winning a game. And there's another guy that I, I, I like, he's a golfer, his name's Stuart Sink. He, he's, he's been golfing for years and years and years and he's won a major in several PGA championships. So he knows what those circumstances can bring. He knows that how great they can be. But two years ago, he won a championship and, and after the championship, he, uh, he's doing a press conference. And one of the people from Golf Digest asked him this question. They say, hey, Stuart, you know, it seems like I've heard people talk about there's, um, there's this alignment between how good your golf game is and the peace that you have in life. And can you confirm that, Stuart? You know, is, if you have more peace, is your golf game better? If your golf game's better, are they really connected? And Stuart has a phenomenal answer. It's about one minute. I want you to watch this clip. Uh, it's a big part of it for sure. Um, and certainly I believe that Kevin Streelman's right when he says that about having uh, peace and joy in your life leads to a more peaceful and joyful golfer and that leads to better scores. Um, but uh, it's, the thing about me and my family with, uh, with the peace and joy we experience, it's not something that just we wait for the circumstances to line up like the planets or some you know, signs or tea leaves or something. You know, we install our own um, peace and joy because of our faith in Jesus Christ, basically. And that is the number one tenet of my life. And uh, it enables me to feel peaceful and joyful even when the golf ball is not agreeing with my club face and not going in the hole. Um, I don't seek peace and joy out of golf because I know I can never depend on it to fully sustain that kind of peace and joy that I'm looking for. And it's too low of a target. And so um, the joy and peace I feel on the golf course is um, it's something that's, that stems from something far different than golf, and golf happens to benefit from it, but golf is not the end goal for me. Um, I love playing and winning, and having a week like this is just amazing, but 
Um, the peace and joy that we experience and it's available to everybody is something that you don't have to wait for the circumstances, the worm to turn, so to speak. You know, it's, it's there and, and that's what we choose to go for. My favorite part is when he mentions Jesus, the camera guy, like shakes. He's like, what do you say? Stuart clearly is not basing his hope and peace in life on his circumstances or, or the golf matches that he wins. His peace comes from his relationship with God. Paul goes on and he begins to claim that even with the peace we have with God, it helps us in the moments when circumstances are bad when life isn't actually going well. And he says this in chapter five, verses three through four, he says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. Paul is saying there's essentially this chain reaction when we experience suffering. And here's, here's how this works. He says, you experience suffering and, and when you do and life's not well, it, it forces us into this perseverance mode. And, and this word he uses for perseverance is a, a single-mindedness or a, a focused mindset that when we go through suffering or difficult moments in life, no matter how small or great, we're forced to think about what is truly important and what is truly lasting. And we have to persevere through those moments. And then he says that produces character. And this word character is, is also this idea that we have we have been through this before. We have a confidence in what is going to happen through this experience because we've, we've gone through it before. This is another famous phrase in the sports world. If you have a team in a competition and, and they've got all seniors, we say, oh, they're not that nervous because they've been here before. And that's the kind of character that develops in us when we go through dismay or uncomfortable parts of life or suffering. And then eventually he says that this all leads to a hope that we have. And this word hope is this strong assurance and confidence we have in the peace we have with the Lord. And so ultimately Paul is saying, hey, even when we suffer, it drives us closer to our Lord and it, bring, it reminds us of the hope that we have. Which means I, I just have one question for us, church. As we wrap up today, this is one question I want you to think about today in the weeks and months to come. And it's this right here. Where does your peace come from? Where is your peace coming from? I mean, this is a great question for, for those of you who are following Jesus. It's also a great question if you're not. Look, I, we're, I, it's a large church. I get it. We have people here who've made that decision yet. And you know, for some of you, maybe you've been jumping from rock to rock and try, the foundation hasn't been able to hold and the car wasn't enough and, and the job wasn't enough and this thing wasn't enough. And I think it's an important question to ask. Is the thing that you're trying to get peace from in life enough? You know, one great gauge, one great gauge for understanding if we happen to put our peace or hope in things that aren't as strong as the Lord, is if you notice throughout life that you get overly angry or upset or bent out of shape when things don't go well, somebody hits your car, stock market crashes and you watch the numbers plummet and you're, you, know, you just get extremely upset. That is an incredible gauge that you have put too much value on these other things. They do not have a foundation strong enough to hold you up and to give you the peace and hope in life that you need. And so it's a great reminder that the only peace we have comes from our relationship with the Lord and what he has done for us. Now, church, we say this all the time. If, if there's something said today that, that you wanna talk more about, and specifically, you know, if you, if you realize, you know what, Aaron, you're right. There are things in my life I've tried to make a foundation that has began to crack and it's falling apart. And you wanna know more about how Jesus can be a solid foundation for you. We would love to have that conversation. We encourage you to come forward after today's service. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. God, I thank you again, you know, that we are a church body who has this opportunity and this ability to come together every single Sunday to praise your name, to glorify you. And God, I pray as we continue to walk through this letter of Romans, through Paul's words, these words that have influenced and changed so many people's lives throughout history, that we continue to open our heart to it that we continue to understand the grace that Paul is articulating. Lord, I pray that it not only changes our lives, but the peace that we experience, even through suffering, Lord, that we are able to be a witness to others, that this is a sure foundation that we have in you alone. 
So God, may your name be made known and be made famous both through our good days and our bad days because you are good all the time, even when life is not. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.